Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to Swayam Prabha DTH 16 channel. My name is Ariba Shabir and we have been discussing English language teaching. Today we are going to start a new module and this module is assessment. So in this session we will study assessment in second language learning. So before we go ahead let us recapitulate of what we did in the last session. In the last session, we discussed it that it is important to learn and prepare needs analysis before preparing for material production. We also understood that it is important to consider guidelines that are required for designing effective English teaching materials. Besides, we looked on how to adapt material and we studied that it is important to evaluate the material that we prescribe to students. For example, evaluating a textbook on the basis of certain parameters such as authenticity, comprehensibility and the length of uh, the content. Besides, we studied that how authentic materials should be given a spe special focus and if proper guidelines are followed while producing materials, the course is likely to give effective outcomes. The materials should reflect a situation that learners may face in an English speaking environment and this will eventually help them transition into a world where English is the form. So dear learners, as you know that today we are going to talk on assessment. So let us quickly see the slide and try to analyze that the outcomes of the learning would be to develop the general understanding of assessment, types of assessment and characteristics. Besides, we will get to know the difference between assessment and evaluation. In addition, we will be able to identify the main purposes of assessment in the language classroom. And after this session, you will be able to identify the essential qualities of good assessments. Besides, you will also be able to identify methods for reporting on performance. And then we will summarize characteristics of assessment tasks. Now let us look at this slide and understand the concept of assessment. So the first definition, as you see in the slide, mentioned by Jones, it is assessment that is a classroom activity and it is basically a fundamental process which is always required in a classroom and in order to achieve learning and ultimately achievement. So after the learning, what we exactly do is that we assess students and assessment is not just an important part but it is an essential part of any language learning pedagogy. So uh, it is an inclusive activity of language classroom and it is a fundamental concept that is included in any kind of situation. We also see that assessment involves the use of empirical data on student learning to refine programs and improve student learning. So by empirical data, the writer means that we collect the details in the form of marks and at some time we address the qualitative information of these students as well. So we ultimately go for collecting some kind of data uh, which helps us in analyzing the effectiveness of our course and also the progress and the growth of our students. 
another definition which is given by Huber and Fried, they say that assessment is the process of gathering and discussing information from multiple and diverse sources in order to develop a deep understanding of what students know, understand and can do with their knowledge as a result of their educational experiences. The process culminates when assessment results are used to improve subsequent learning. So not just that we collect data and we identify the students growth and potentials. It is also to un important to understand that we gather a deep understanding of what students already have in their bags. By bags, I mean what background knowledge do they consider and of course, what kind of level they have with regard to their understanding of the language and what kind of competency do they possess so that the materials or the methodology which is going to be adapted in the language classroom would be fruitful enough for them. So as you see that we have gone through the three definitions of assessment. Each definition opens up the concept of assessment in a new perspective. And each definition tells us that we collect data, we promote learning, we look for achievement, we analyze the students learning and we ultimately goal for uh, having students developing their exponential extensive growth. Now going on to the next slide, it is important to differentiate the two important concepts here assessment and evaluation because often we see that uh, many of the learners and teachers get confused of these two terms. So let us try to make a sharp differentiation here. Assessment as you read in the first slide, it aims to enable learners to adjust their approach or study habits so that they can enhance their learning, you know, uh, by getting the overview of their performance they eventually find themselves in a position to change themselves, to change their habits or even teachers change their approach in order to promote growth, development and enhance the knowledge that they are providing it to the learners. Now on contrary, we see that evaluation is basically a process that uses a variety of quantitative and qualitative techniques to analyze the program and this is related to pedagogical or course outcomes which are relevant to determine whether they have been met. So we collect the data, we uh, analyze it through quantitative and qualitative analysis and then we look for its validity with regard to the pedagogical implementation that is what evaluation stands for. However, assessment gives a broader uh, view and it tells us that what to adopt, what not to adopt and how to take the class throughout the course. The essential point which is mentioned in this slide says that assessment is a diagnostic tool which is mainly focused on the learning of individual students whereas evaluation actually determines the extent, it takes us to the depth to which a program of pedagogy you know achieves or predetermined goals or outcomes. So uh, as you have got a sharp uh, understanding of two important concepts assessment evaluation and uh, we have also got to know that though both the tools are interrelated but they are quite different when it comes to implementation. Now, why do we uh, include assessment? What is its purpose? And in order to search the answer of these questions, let us first look up at the purpose of assessment. Why, you know, uh, uh, what, what would uh, do we uh, aim for? What vision do we have when it comes to implementing assessment into our classrooms? So, at first we Think of checking the students progress, how far they have learned and it should give teachers 
feedback on their students performance at different stages of the course. So, it is pretty clear over here that teachers in order to get the feedback and in order to assess the students performances, they conduct assessment and it is mandatory and it is an inclusive, inclusive part of any classroom pedagogy. But when it comes to initial or diagnostic assessment, we will get to know the concept of the diagnostic assessment in the other slides as well. But here let us try to understand the point that diagnostic assessments which are often conducted at the initial uh, time of uh, language learning. So, these kind of assessments help teachers, educators, policy makers, especially syllabus designers, material producers to identify the students strengths and weaknesses and on the basis of that the learners uh, get the required material. So, what I am trying to tell you here is that learners uh, not just get the material what they required, but teachers also find uh, a reason and also they get to know about their strengths and weaknesses and then they include, include skills accordingly. The other point which is mentioned over here is that we have formative assessment which is done throughout the course in order to check the students progress. These are the kind of assessments which are eventually done during the course process. And then by the end of the semester or the course, we conduct summative assessment which is designed to find out what students can do and what students cannot do at the end of the course. So, it basically brings the crux of the course and the crux of the learning and it is very essential. However, both formative keeps uh, the progress, summative brings the uh, last result. There is a difference that we will go through in the other slide, but let us try to you know view these concepts in a broader horizon and understand the point that reinforcing the students learning is important and that is the ultimate reason why we conduct assessment. It is a way of giving students regular feedback so that they are aware of their growth. In addition, it gives teachers basic information about how successful the teaching is. Uh, so that they can see whether the approach is correct, the aims of the course are appropriate and you know the materials which we often uh, talk about are enough efficient or, or use are efficient enough or are good enough uh, to help the learners grow in a better way. So, these are the purposes of assessment and uh, uh, because it provides a whole view of the students learning progress, their personality, their growth, their development and their progress. Uh, so, you know the purpose is pretty clear and it gives a broader perspective, a broader view on how to look up at the classroom, how to proceed further and what do you expect at the end of the course. Now, moving on to the next slide, let us look up at the three important uh, concepts uh, which are known as the types of assessment though we have used these terms in the previous slide also but in order to give you a deeper understanding let us take these topics in detail so as you see the first one is the initial or diagnostic why initial because diagnostics test is often conducted at the beginning of the course Assessment is done at the beginning of the course and it uh, basically aims to identify the students particular strengths and weaknesses. So, it is basically a pre-assessment or a pre-test where teachers can evaluate students strengths, weaknesses, knowledge and skills before the instruction. And these assessments are typically low stakes. and usually do not count for uh, grades. An identical assessment may be given post instruction to identify if students have met a course required learning objectives, but with this form of assessment teachers can plan and uh, you know they can plan meaningful and efficient instruction and can provide students with an individualized learning experience. So, a uh, meaningful way is basically created 
with the help of diagnostic assessment and written by students the diagnostic assessment is a tool for teachers to better understand what students already know about a topic when submitted before the start of the course and diagnostic assessments let me tell you are used to gauge where students currently stand that is intellectually emotionally and ideologically now coming on to the second uh, term which is written over here and that is formative assessment so what do we think of formative assessment formative assessment is done throughout the course in order to check the students progress though formative and summative assessments are interrelated but there is a huge difference between the two concepts let me take up this as well summative assessment is designed to find out what students can and cannot do at the end of the course like we talked in the last slide as well so what i'm trying to mention you here is that formative and summative assessments are widely practiced components of classroom setting that report ongoing and final progress of the learner so despite of challenges in integrating formative assessment and summative assessments into english language instruction its implementation has been supported in accordance with the students needs so let us not uh, forget the fact that summative assessment is conducted annually or it is uh, conducted uh, at the conclusion of the program how well students are equipped with skills knowledge and have made achievement when it comes to the progress and uh, checking out the progress annually so uh, you know students are asked to write ass ass assignments test or projects to determine whether they have learned of what they are, were expecting or not and you know the achievement test is also conducted at the conclusion of the session where learners are given the specific instructional period to attempt certain questions and the test does not assess the strength or weaknesses of the learner but it actually determines the overall experience of the learner and the learning that took place in the whole session the results are either presented in scores or grades which are further reported into students record so uh, like you have studied uh, these three important concepts diagnostic formative sum summative and i'm sure you have now got a pretty clear idea that how these three are distinct uh, with each other and they have a different purpose to serve when it comes to language learning and teaching pedagogy so uh, it's it's quite uh, clear that uh, we would need all these kind of assessments in order to make students learn and develop language and also in order to help our teachers to implement the course and design the materials in an efficient way now moving on to the next slide let us try to understand that why do we assess i mean we have got this fact that assessment is important it's an inclusive part of the language learning pedagogy we looked for the purposes of assessment but what are the essential components that we take into consideration what assessment criteria are there on the basis of which uh, we look for certain parameters so i put this into this slide and let us go one by one at first there is linguistic skills so when i talk about linguistic skills it means there are set parameters that you look for when it comes to assessing the students learning with regard to language learning so first is pronunciation so you see that many students have difficulty in pronouncing sir sound sir sound and sh sound similarly dark la and uh, light la and then plenty of sounds they find difficult to understand and many times we see that because of the interference of the mother tongue there is a difficulty in pronouncing the right and accurate sounds so you mainly look for the english sounds if they are produced correctly and that's why the pronunciation comes into account in order to sound intelligible 
you need to look for pronunciation and that is quite essential for any language learning. Therefore, pronunciation plays an important role and it is generally assessed when it comes to language learning and teaching. Since uh, language is inclusive of vocabulary, so we cannot forget the important role that is played by it. So, it is not just that we learn the vocabulary or we know the number of words that are there in the dictionary, rather vocabulary is more for what kind of word is suited when it comes to uh, context. So, there should be a match between the content and the context. Uh, so, the vocabulary plays an important role when it comes to assessing language learning. And then we uh, see grammar which is again an essential part. Why grammar? Because grammar and the sense of grammaticality that is developed in second language learners or foreign language learners, they, they, uh, they makes uh, them intelligible and therefore, a correct or uh, accurate grammatical sentence gives uh, the better results. Therefore, uh, it is not just that only grammatical sentence is put in a right way, but also uh, meaningfully it is creating an impact. So, grammar is uh, important and linguistically it should be accurate. Besides, let us not forget the role of spellings. Uh, sometimes we see that in English language spelling keeps on uh, uh, keeps on mattering and uh, uh, spellings uh, differ from one to the other. It does not follow as such the norm. So, spelling is uh, very important when it comes to assessing and then role of discourse. So, when a writer produces a write up, is there any coherence in the text, right? The other thing is, is there any cohesion in the text? By cohesion, I mean are there devices, cohesive devices that are used. So, uh, you know these uh, coherence and cohesion uh, as a part of discourse play an important role when it comes to assessing. So, uh, uh, when we look at text or when we hear a second language learner, it is not merely that one component we assess, but we mainly look the whole uh, scenario and this whole uh, scenario consists of pronunciation, vocabulary, grammar, spelling and the rule of discourse which are uh, constituting towards a particular um, outcome. And we are not consigned to only linguistic skills. Let me tell you that they are communicative skills. If you remember in the methods we talked about um, lingua accuracy versus apro appropriacy. So, it is not just the grammatical structure that matters, but the meaning also is there which matters a lot. So, we talked about communicative competence as well. And we mentioned that communicative competence helps a learner to analyze the, uh, the text or the word uh, in, in a social context. So, communicative competence focus more on social clues, right. So, we assess communicative skills in addition to linguistic skills and uh, communicative skills will fall under the four categories that are also known as the four skills of language. These are listening, speaking, reading and writing. The efficiency of performance includes fluency, appropriacy, coherence and uh, a wide choice of structures and lexes that are available in the text. So, by fluency is the facility of a, a, a task performance uh, if the learner is able to complete it with the right speed. The appropriacy is the suitability of the content that is uh, uh, put up in the context. Then one sentence is connected with the other which is ultimately uh, the reflection of coherence 
that is the logical development of the content and then a wide variety of structures and you know there is a variation which exists one sentence is simple the other one could be compound and you know you could find complex sentences so not just one kind of sentence that you see you see that the learners are they able to produce a wide variety of sentences in the particular context or situation so these are the components that we look for and uh, we assess on the uh, the text on the basis of these uh, kind of uh, factors that are responsible for making the content enriching now going on to the next slide uh, let us answer this question that when do we assess what is the right time to assess is it uh, that in between the course we can assess or at the end of the course we assess or is it something like we do it at the beginning so what are the right timings when it comes to assessing the language ability so let's see these points uh, as uh, mentioned by the researchers we often do assessments at the beginning of the course which means we may do it as initial assessment or diagnostic assessment to help learners and teachers identify their strengths and weaknesses now at the end of the course we either do the summative which means that whether we have achieved the goal or not and uh, we also call achievement test which is quite important when it comes to the completion of course that how much achievement you have taken or how much gains you have collected uh, from the course so both the ways are possible and uh, when uh, it is done throughout the course not only at the end of the specific periods they are formally regarded as uh, formative assessments moreover we also do continuous assessments now coming up to the concept of continuous assessments which may include informal activities done in the ordinary lesson and not only under formal exam conditions so it usually happens that when the teacher wants to know if a particular or a short term goal is achieved or not then what happens is that the continuous assessment is Uh, often regulated and this helps the teacher and the learner to know uh, the progress at that particular point of time so it is quite time bounded and uh, it helps us to know whether we are constituting towards ourselves towards the short goals and then you know when the short term goals are covered this will ultimately lead to the uh, long term goals so we'll go step by step it's not that the holistic way in in a way that we will lead to we, we will move towards uh, the long term goals we will uh, go from simple to complex or we can divide our course components into fragments and into fragments and chunks so a continuous assessment is quite helpful and we can do it in the form of uh, group discussions we can eventually take surprise tests and we can give them activities and tasks so that we would come to know the application part of our methodology so all these uh, uh, periods be it the beginning or at the end or throughout or at the you know um, um, in or in an, in an informal way all the ways are possible so dear learners now let us try to look up at the characteristics that are involved in assessment so uh, there are five points that are mentioned here and let's go one by one at first validity is there so an assessment task is considered valid if it reflects the knowledge and skill you intend to check if it measures what it claims to be measuring so if you are including listening uh, assessment you should include a variety of listening task as well it's not just that you include only one kind of listening test which may not give you a clear idea of your students learning in a deeper way so you should include a variety of it a variations would always be helpful so let's consider the fact 
that listening can be categorized into listening for specific information and listening for gist. And when it comes to listening for specific information, you can ask students to identify or to listen for one or two particular details that were announced, right? And in listening for gist, you can uh, make them listen the whole story or the announcement or the TED talk. And then you can ask, what do you think uh, uh, this talk is about? And what opinions do you form? So on the basis of the knowledge that they will form, they will eventually be able to put up their points of uh, views. So what I am trying to mention you is that knowledge and skill you intend to check should be included. It should measure what it aims to be. It should not be devoid or deprived of the objective that you had taken at the beginning of the course. So validity is an important component of any assessment. A valid assessment is always uh, uh, a, a helpful tool for any language teacher and learner uh, and a valid assessment will give you a deeper reflection of your learner's uh, progress and the development. Now coming on to the second point. So now let us take up another important concept over here that is transparency. A transparent assessment is always an ideal one and the marking system should be clear and the learner should know the system as well as the minimum score to pass. This will guide the learners to do uh, the test in a better way and uh, you know when you uh, give them the uh, sense of accountability and you empower them with the parameters that they are going to be uh, analyze, they are going to be judged, they will find uh, themselves in a position to uh, get command over those uh, things. So uh, it is important to help learners get aware on the parameters that they are going to be judged on and they should be clear enough about the system that is going to be followed. So for example, they are listening, speaking and reading and writing skills. You should tell the learners that listening is going to be comprised of 20 marks and the speaking would comprised of let us say 30 marks. The rest of the uh, components would uh, include the rest of the marks. You know in this way you will tell them the weightage and then you can tell them that when it comes to speaking ability you will be judged on the basis of clarity on the basis of the content development your pronunciation would matter and your confidence would matter so in this way learners will build these parameters in themselves and they will come prepared and they will know what they have to perform and therefore this will make the test transparent and they will be empowered with the kind of uh, accountability that they always seek for. Now after knowing validity and transparency, let us look up at the concept of feasibility. So teachers should consider ease of setting, time involved, administering and scoring. Uh, it is important to think of the time constraints that uh, your learners are going to face. So what generally happens is that you design a long test and as a result uh, the time which is given to the learners are not is not enough. Therefore you should think that uh, before you make the test and you aim for assessing it, think of the parameters like what time uh, frame is being given to the learners. Is it going to be for 2 hours? or is it going to be one hour and even in continuous assessment or in formative assessments if it is going to be for let us say 30 minutes or maybe 45 minutes. So is your test justifying the time frame that is given to the learners? So time is quite essential in order to make the learning and the assessment feasible. Also teachers should consider the setting are they going to be sitting in a comfortable place also, if the computer equipment is going to uh, be included, then is, are these equipments working properly? What about the internet connection and who will administer this test? How many invigilators would be there? What would be the criteria and what would be the rubrics or the scoring system that would be involved when it comes to assessing it? So you have to think of the feasibility of the test and 
eventually identify its shortcomings as well. So, that you make a proper setting and you deliver the test in a most successful way. Now, coming on to the next point, it is mentioned over here reliability, how far the test becomes reliable. The assessment uh, gives the reflection of being reliable. This has to do with the consistency of the results of your assessment. So, a reliable assessment task is one that produces essentially the same results consistently on different occasions when the conditions of the assessment remain the same. So, for instance, uh, let us say that your learner has gained uh, 15 marks in listening out of 30. And in uh, reading also, the learner has got somehow 18 or 19 marks out of 30. Now, what happens is that if your uh, learner gains uh, 28 out of 30 in speaking, it may reflect the point that a test might not be reliable enough. Why? Because these four skills are not going in line. You know, a good and a reliable test has to show the consistency of the learners. So, it actually produces the same results. So, if a learner has got let us say 15 and then 20 or maybe 18 or maybe let us say 23, 24, it should be somehow the around the circle. It cannot go too far. So, that is what reliability takes us uh, to the fact and therefore, a, a reliable test helps you to, uh, uh, to, to make the assessment clear and uh, essential to use. So, now, let us look up at the last point which is mentioned in this slide, it is discrimination. By discrimination, I do not mean to discriminate the students on the basis of their social, political or economic factors. What I am trying to uh, make a pitch over here is that your assessment should be enough uh, to distinguish between the students who are good, average and weak. So, by good I mean competent. By average, I mean modest and by weak performance performers, I would mean novice learners. So, novice are those who have just started their journey towards learning process or they are at the initial stages of learning. So, when it comes to competent learners, modest learners and novice learners, you will be ultimately helpful to get the idea of how your class is going to look like, how far this heterogeneity is comprised of and also you will be able to find ease in grouping the students because you cannot group all the novice students at a time, right. And also you cannot group, uh, you know, four competent students in one place. So, you have to somehow bring the mix of the learners and when I say mix by me, by this concept I mean that let us say if you are making uh, the group of six students, you, you should think of including two competent, right, two uh, modest and at least two novice learners. So, that each student would learn from one another. And you know, if you include all novice learners in one group, like 6 out of 6, then what will happen? They would not be able to learn from each other. They would remain at the same place. So, assessment not only gives you what kind of method should you adopt and how should you take the proceedings, rather it helps the learners in a broad way because you get a lot, know a lot about their competency and therefore, you find is in experimenting uh, your methods, your activities and ultimately your assessment brings learning which is the ultimate goal of the language learning pedagogy. Now, in this slide, let us look how to plan for learning. Like you have conducted the assessment, now how can you facilitate the knowledge and the skills that you are going to provide in the field. So, planning and implementation both are important, but at the same time they are different also. 
it would require different skills to go through it. Let us see how to plan first for learning. So, decide what is going to be learnt in a particular session and define the learning goals, communicate the learning goals to the learners. So, at the beginning of the session, uh, try to give the frame of what they are going to learn, mention the syllabus, give them the outcomes. Tell them that what objectives do you have when it comes to the implementation of this course. And also try to make them convinced that the methodology, the approaches that the teacher and the learner is going to have in the classroom, the kind of rapport they are going to build throughout, it would ultimately help them to uh, bring more learning into the language learning classroom. So, therefore, what I am trying to mention over here is that uh, giving an introductory session or orientation session would eventually give a warm up kind of uh, uh, sense to them and uh, this warm up activity would eventually help the teacher and the learner to find ease among themselves and also the ice would be broken up. This ice breaking session like I always say it is very important and at the same point of time you help the learner to get through the objectives know the learner out, learning outcomes and analyze the subject contents so that they can give their point of views and uh, eventually know what uh, they seek for after this class. Now, the next point as it is mentioned over here, you should compile questions and design tasks to check learner understanding of the learning code questions. It is not like that once you, you know you have got the syllabus, you have got the topics and you just start the uh, uh, session and you go through it. It cannot be like that. Always include activities and tasks and tests which are quite formal as well as informal. Include all those kind of factors that would ultimately make your learning and teaching exciting. So, this kind of excitement will ultimately help the learners to achieve and the task and as a result the designing of those tasks and activities will, uh, will, will promote better development of uh, the, learn, the methods. And keep on checking the learners understanding by adopting various assessments. If you have conducted diagnostic assessment that is pretty good. But by the end of the course, do the achievement test as well. And if you want to make your learners more amazed, then give them the difference between the diagnostic and the achievement test. Make them aware that where were they standing and now at what point are they standing. So, this will make them amazed and at the same time they will find it more acknowledging and they will credit give the credit to the teacher and the purpose of the course will be solved. Now, coming on to the next point as mentioned here, explain to the learners the criteria which will be used to assess their work, decide how feedback is going to be provided. It is not just that the teacher uh, who is responsible to uh, assign tasks and you know prescribe the materials, but you should also incorporate the learners feedback and the learners feedback will give you the glimpse of what is correct, what is appropriate, what is more exciting to them and always think of those matters, those uh, contents that make them excited and those are essential as well as relevant. So, suppose if learners say that they like group discussion activities in their classroom or if they prefer to use PowerPoint presentations in their classroom. So, incorporate those techniques and tools more in the future and such kind of feedback will not negatively give you uh, any uh, criticism, but it will ultimately promote the development of the teacher. Now, coming on to the next point, define how learners will take an active part in the assessment process. So, um, learners will not become passive here, they will not sit at one place and they will not go through what they are prescribed for, but they will take part actively. They will participate 
in the discussion and they will be the persons who will be responsible in, in making their course successful. So things will go on both the sides. And when the learners are uh, active enough in contributing towards their development, they should uh, give their opinions, views uh, in uh, planning and implementing of the course as well. So it is quite important as well as exciting to incorporate the learners feedback and make them active throughout the course as well as in the planning part as well. Now coming on to the last point, plan opportunities for learners to use the feedback provided on the assessment decision to uh, make the progress ahead. Now why I say that uh, feedback uh, gives the learners the opportunity to work on the assessment as well as the learning because these opportunities uh, are beneficial for policy makers for material designers, for educators, for students themselves, for the parents and the administrators. So by making the learners active in the process, you will be able to work on each component of the language pedagogy, be it in the, inside the classroom or the factors and the people that are responsible outside the classroom. Now coming on to the next slide, how to communicate the assessment criteria. You can tell that you know these number of uh, 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 as, uh, these number of marks will be credited to this particular skill, but how to communicate there is a proper criteria to do that and while looking up in this slide let us quickly see that you should use appropriate language and terminology. Remember assessment is not to discourage them or not to judge them in a negative way. It is ultimately made for their upliftment, their development. Therefore, you should be very cautious when it comes to the use of vocabulary and the terminology that you say when it comes to judging. Like instead of saying the weak learner, you can use novice word. This novice means that uh, learner is at the initial stage uh, or at the beginning of the course or is the person who has just started to go through this journey. Not the person who is quite confident or you know who is quite ahead. And if you say a person who is novice and you regard him or her as weak, then there are possibilities that learner would take it in a negative way or would feel discouraged. So be very cautious when it comes to using terminology and what learners have developed. Do not give them very tough tasks that are not uh, relevant to them and also are ahead of them. So give the tasks which are suitable. It is quite good to give them the challenging tasks, but not at the cost of their not at the cost of the possibility. So think of those criteria and parameter where they find ease and at the same time exciting and challenging as well. So uh, like if you ask a question, uh, let's say what are the presentation, uh, uh, what are the steps that are involved in presentation skills, instead you can ask them that uh, you are going to present a topic on water scarcity. Mention the steps that you will involve while preparing for the presentation. This will be an applied method. It will help them to not just focus on the concepts, but it will make them close and uh, they will feel associated with the uh, question and the personalized feeling would be created. So uh, you should be particular when it comes to assessing uh, them and also the terminology, the language you put up in asking the questions and so on. Besides, you should communicate the learning goals and assessment criteria and check learner uh, uh, to know where you have reached far. And besides that, you should understand how the assessment criteria can be met by the use of examples. Incorporating examples would make the learning and teaching easy. Encourage peer assessment through effective use of assessment criteria and more than that you should think of self assessment through effective use of the assessment criteria. Now this self assessment uh, will give them the opportunity to look their performances through the lens of 
different perspectives. They can analyze their performance uh, uh, through the lens of uh, language delivery, confidence, clarity, pronunciation, content development and so on. So, self assessment is quite helpful because they realize it and when the realization take place, they, there is learning as well. So, uh, if you say the student that this is wrong or this is right, they may not take you positively or may not uh, uh, really realize it. But when they experience it and realize it, they will eventually learn it as well. So, realization makes uh, self-assessment a successful technique in assessment criteria. Let us look up at the conclusion now and uh, the first point says, language assessment is a measure of the proficiency and language user has in, in any given language. Therefore, less language assessment provides you a broader scope of understanding the learner's growth and development. However, there is a distinction between the language assessment and the language evaluation. So, when it comes to evaluation, it is a systematic way of analyzing subjects merit, worth and significance using framework governed by a set of norms. So, we go through the qualitative and the quantitative data analysis that would be under the evaluation criteria. Now, coming on to the types of assessment that we studied. So, we first looked on the diagnostic assessment, which is a form of pre-assessment or a kind of pre-test where teachers can evaluate the students strong points, their weak points and their knowledge and their skills before they start their class. So, this gives them the whole idea what they are going to teach, what components should they include in their language teaching pedagogy and what methods should they adopt in order to help the learners go through the curriculum. Besides, you studied formative and summative assessments which are widely practiced components of classroom setting that report ongoing and final progress of the learner. So, formative is something that we go uh, through it eventually, like you can do it in the semester, then you can go, do it after the semester uh, before you start the second semester and then you can, it can keep on continuing in the middle of the semester also the formative assessment can work on. But this semester, uh, but, but this summative assessment happens at the end of the, there you measure the final outcome and both play an important role when it comes to language learning. So, uh, teachers and students of English language deal with various assessment procedures in their lives on a daily basis. When students are say, sitting in their classrooms, you may not even tell them that they are getting assessed. It could be for observation purpose and like I said that formative assessment can be done in informal ways or you can say continuous assessment can be done uh, informally. What you can do is that you should not tell the students at some points where they do not require to get informed and you can eventually measure the progress and modify what you uh, are going to include in the next instruction accordingly. Now, coming on to the next point, they organize and administer classroom assessment activities, use forms of continuous or formative assessment and furthermore new developments in language teaching and learning require new competencies of teachers like maintaining portfolio, self-assessment and peer assessment. Uh, as far as the portfolio and self-assessment and you know peer assessments are concerned, we will look up at these topics in detail in uh, another session. But let me give you this idea that uh, in language learning and teaching pedagogy, there are lots of uh, varieties that are available. It is not that the traditional test that you give to the learner, you can conduct assessment in varying uh, methods. For example, you can measure your students progress through uh, portfolio as well. Portfolio basically gives the detailed reflection of your learner's growth and development because it is eventually developed over time. Similarly, you can give them the opportunity of self-realization or self-assessment and then they would find out their responses in light of the certain parameters and they will get to know what uh, are the components that they need to learn, where they stand and how they can go ahead. So, uh, you know, 
new developments take place when you include new competencies and uh, teachers need not to remain consigned to only these kind of uh, assessment criteria or methods they can eventually develop on their own depending upon the size and the level of the learners that is something very important to um, understand tailor uh, the classroom instruction in accordance with your students you know the class size you know the background of the learners like you uh, gathered these information in the needs analysis you know the course outcomes and the goals what you are seeking what your learners are speaking where you both the partners are inclining and so on so um, there is a wider scope for assessment as far as the research uh, purpose is concerned uh, there are variety of computer technology tools that are available in the market they are assessing learners skills in varying forms and uh, there is always a question on reliability and validity when it comes to looking up those uh, tools uh, so uh, there is a huge uh, scope of uh, researching over uh, uh, co of computer assisted language uh, learning uh, assessments and we will look the assessment forms in the next session in detail and we have so far come to an end of this session but i'm sure you have learned a lot these are the references see you in the next session thank you very much for joining Understanding oneself, understanding others, understanding society at large, understanding the nature, these are all driven by basic human curiosity. We would all love to understand why things happen, what happens, what is the final outcome, why certain things fail. These are all exercises that we perform in various domains of knowledge. Therefore, knowledge in various domains you would realize they are actually social artifacts. They have to be rooted into historical perspective, they have to be culturally salient and there would be socio-political reasons behind this. Whether you talk with respect to engineering sciences, whether you talk with respect to physical sciences, biological sciences, social sciences, that is the reason why humanities and social sciences should be understood by all of us. The knowledge that is segregated, that is divided with respect to areas, specializations, all of them needs to be understood in its context. And what provides the context? It is the social reality. How do you correlate knowledge in a given domain with the cultural reality, with the social reality? with the socio-political compulsions. Okay. How do you understand the law of nature okay, in its totality? And for doing that, you require the understanding of humanities and social sciences. Say for instance, if you are trying to understand the effect of a particular bacteria, a virus, any microbe, how it affects behavior, how it affects the organism, human being. You start looking at it from a pure biological point of view. If you are trying to look at a particular type of a wavelength, say for example, you are emphasizing on the understanding of the effect of radiation on human life. You are looking at things from a physical point of view. You are looking at the corresponding changes inside the body. You are looking at the physiological side of the uh, understanding of the information. You are trying to understand why despite knowing the risk that is inbuilt in the process, why still human beings engage into it. You are looking at it from a pure behavioral point of view. Why society at large admire things which has full of risk. You are trying to understand things from a pure sociological point of view. 
why people use particular uh, set of words to explain those experiences. You are trying to understand things from the linguistic point of view. So, there are whole lot of things and then finally, you try to combine all of them to say that what are the guiding principles in life. Then you say you are looking at life, you are looking at humanity from a pure philosophical point of view and this is what social sciences courses provide you. They provide the context to you in which you would be finally positioning the understanding of the knowledge in any given domain. It could be engineering, it could be sciences, it could be medical sciences, it could be social sciences stuff, it could be humanities stuff. So, con contextualizing the knowledge is what humanities social science courses help you obtain.